Lawrence Lessig is the director of the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard University. He is the author of numerous books, most recently One Way Forward, The Outsider's Guide to Fixing the Republic. And he is the founder of Mayday PAC, the super PAC to end all super PACs, uh, to get money out of politics. He is a tireless crusader against corruption and the money that is polluting our democracy. He travels the country relentlessly campaigning, speaking, and lobbying on this issue. And I can say that no one works harder or does more. And it is our very great honor to have him here. And so with that, I would like to welcome Lawrence Lessig. So it is, it is, it is really, really wonderful to be here with you, with you. The future, not just of the party they call the Democratic Party, but the future of democracy in America, you. Now, I come from a small state up in the north. You might have heard of it, Massachusetts. It's a place where people feel free to call themselves progressive, even liberal. We use that word to talk about ourselves openly in mixed company. We call ourselves progressives and liberals, and we have a proud tradition of the very greatest leaders for progressive and liberal ideas in the nation, from Charles Sumner to the Kennedys, to a senator you may have heard of, Elizabeth Warren. Yeah. You've heard of Elizabeth Warren, right? So Elizabeth Warren is famous for many, many things, inspirations that have captured us. But the one I want you to think about for a moment is her slogan, the system is rigged. The system is rigged. Now, all of you want to be on stage with Elizabeth Warren someday. I want you to take that moment right now. I want you to say with me out loud together with Elizabeth Warren. There she is on stage. I want you to say with me, the system is rigged. No, no, no. Better than that. Come on. The system is rigged. Now, that truth, that self-evident truth is believed by 82% of Americans. They agree. Not just liberals, not just progressives, but 82% of Americans agree. The system is rigged. But the question is, what do we do about it? When we say the system is rigged, we talk a lot about what we're against, but what are we for? And when we say the system is rigged, when we think the system is rigged, we get to also think, what are we going to do about this rigged system? What are we going to do right now about this rigged system? Let's think a little bit about what it means for this system to be rigged. <clears throat> the defining struggle of American history is a struggle for racial equality, the defining fight for 400 years. Right, for 250 years, there was a war against slavery. You say, that sounds a little bit long. I thought the Civil War was four years. But that's white man's history, right? The war against slavery began the first moment a black soul was ripped from the heart of Africa and brought to America to be a slave. That was the beginning of that war. And then 240 years into that war, the white men joined. The white men joined when the first great party, a party founded on a single ideal, the ideal to end slavery, was born. And it elected a president and then started the war, which eventually ended slavery. 250 years it took for that simple idea to be achieved that humans were not property. Now, we have not begun to account for that history. We as a nation have not begun to account for what that means. That war is still with us today. And after that war, for 100 years, we fought a second war, a war to achieve civil equality in America. And that war was born with great, great hopefulness. We forget 
that in the years after the Civil War, African Americans were elected to the United States Congress. The first senator was sent to the United States Senate, Blanche Bruce. All across the South, in Southern legislatures, African Americans were elected, became majorities. All across the South, blacks began to believe it was possible to have democracy, that they could be equal citizens. But then the first great terrorist war in America broke out. And we didn't have a George Bush or a Dick Cheney back then to fight those terrorists. Instead, those terrorists, those who took that war for freedom and inverted it into a war to re-enslave Americans, won. Those terrorists silenced the movement for equality in the South because Northerners were too tired and they retreated and for a hundred years, in effect, we lived in a nation once again where a people were enslaved, not through slavery, but through the denial of the most basic rights to participate as equals in a society. And then at the end of that war too, the whites joined. The whites joined. And when the whites joined, and this got to be an issue no one could ignore anymore because of the leadership of people like Dr. King and Malcolm X, who made this the central issue in America. After 100 years, we achieved extraordinary victories in the form of legislation like the Civil Rights Act and, most importantly, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But after that war, We've now been in the middle of a 50-year war to achieve not just civil equality, but also economic equality in America. And that war, too, began, on, began with hopeful signs. That war, too, began with a dream for equal society, with the Lyndon Johnson promise that we would build a society with equal opportunity for all. But then very quickly, those ideals got lost as America spun into an idiotic war in Vietnam and an even more idiotic war against drugs that made it impossible for the poor in this society to rise up because the economic world they lived in told them they could not. Yeah. <laughs> These absurd and useless wars over the last 50 years have institutionalized a system of inequality in the society. They've taught our police to treat our citizens like they're grunts at some military camp where what they expect is discipline, to respect not them as humans, but to treat them as if they are just to be disciplined by the police. We have built this because of this system of inequality that we have allowed to develop in the society and that we have not fought against. Now, when we tell this story of racism in America, this is often really framed as a kind of North versus South story. There is no North versus South in this story. The slavery that existed in America for 250 years was practiced in the South but profited on from the North. Exactly. The 100 years to get civil equality was an inequality imposed in the South, but allowed by the blindness of the North. And the inequality of the last 50 years through these useless, senseless wars has been fought all across the country, not just in the South. This is not North versus South. This is America not living up to the fundamental ideal of America. This is us not being who we are. So when I hear a movement that now needs to express itself in this slogan, Black Lives Matter, it hurts. It hurts. It hurts to think 400 years into this struggle, this is what we have to say? 400 years into a fight, we're still arguing about this, this. I have a five-year-old daughter. I don't know how to begin to explain to my five-year-old daughter 
why this is a slogan in America today. All I can say, all I can hope to get her to see is this is a slogan that reminds us of who we could be because this is a reality of who we are not yet. We are not yet a society that respects our people equally. We are not the society we promised ourselves we would be. Now in this history, there's been amazing leaders fighting for this equality, none more optimistic and hopeful than Dr. King. Dr. King in 1961, June 6th, went to Lincoln University. He gave a speech, he said this about America. He said, for in a real sense, America is essentially a dream. The substance of the dream is expressed in these sublime words, words lifted to cosmic proportions that we are all created equal. It's hard for me to understand how a man as knowledgeable as Dr. King with the knowledge of the history he had of America had the courage, had the hope to be able to stand and say before America, we are a nation founded with this dream that we were created equal because the reality was not a life of equality. But he knew there was a way back from that inequality. And he knew a central step to getting back from that inequality was to find the capacity for citizens to act as citizens. To act as citizens, most importantly, in the political process. King's most important fight led to the enactment of the most important legislation in the last 50 years, the Voting Rights Act. But when King talked about voting, you have to hear him the way a black man would hear it, not the way a white man would understand it. When King talked about voting, he said, so long as I do not firmly and irrevocably possess the right to vote, I do not possess myself. That's the invocation of slavery. I do not possess myself. To deny equal right to vote is to recreate the system of slavery. I cannot make up my mind. It is made up for me. I cannot live as a democratic citizen. Observing the laws I have helped to enact, I can only submit to the edict of others. This ideal was an ideal for equality, citizen equality. But as we remember King, or as most Americans, I won't speak for the progressives, as most Americans remember King, they remember him talking about this as a matter of racial equality. And we never got to see who King would become. We had clues, but they were stopped by the massacre that occurred in Memphis. We had clues about who he would become. Because after he won the Nobel Prize, he began to shift the debate. He began to talk about issues that were not just, not tied exclusively to race, talk about issues that were much more fundamental. He had come to recognize that racial equality would only be achieved when a more fundamental equality was achieved as well. As he wrote, now when I say the question, the whole society, it means ultimately coming to see that the problem of racism, the problem of exploitation, and the problem of war are all tied together. These are the triple evils that are interrelated. This ideal that he was hinting at at the end of his life, before his life was ended, was the recognition we had a more fundamental fight, a fight for a bigger equality, more fundamental than just one section of society, a core fight, the fight to achieve the power as a citizen equally in our society, only then could we have a society that would protect all the poor, the exploited, those sent off to war? Only then, when we were equal citizens, could we achieve the dreams we told ourselves we were founded to achieve. Okay, now there are many moments, there are many aspects of that inequality. I wanna focus for a second on just one. <clears throat> You've heard of this place called Texas. <laughs> 
I hope you've heard of this extraordinary man, Dr. Lawrence Nixon. Dr. Lawrence Nixon lived in El Paso, Texas. He moved there in 1910. And every two years, between 1910 and 1922, Dr. Nixon would walk down to his polling place, pay his poll tax, and vote. But in 1924, when Dr. Nixon walked down to his polling place and paid his poll tax, he was told by the judges at the polling place, Dr. Nixon, you know you can't vote. And Nixon said, I know I can't, but I've got to try. Now, the reason he couldn't in 1924 was that in 1923, Texas had by law, in the law itself, explicitly in the statute, said African Americans were not permitted to vote in the Democratic primary. The only party in Texas in those days, kind of hard to imagine, but the only party in the Texas in those days was the Democratic Party. Blacks were not permitted to vote in the Democratic Party primary. It was an all-white primary. Only whites got to vote. So 16% of Texas was excluded in this critical first step with the obvious consequence, right? This totally obvious to produce a democracy responsive to whites only. That was a system of inequality baked into the express law of Texas. Now, it turns out Texas didn't invent that system of inequality, that particular way to achieve inequality. It was invented by this man, a northerner, Boss Tweed, New York's boss of Tammany Hall. Boss Tweed used to love to say, I don't care who does the electing, as long as I get to do the nominating. The nominating. Right? Boss Tweed. <laughs> Boss Tweed understood the way politics works. If you control the nomination, it doesn't matter who gets to vote in the election, because every candidate knows they have to keep you happy. And if they got to keep you happy, they'll say what they need to say to the voters, but they're going to work as hard as they can to keep you happy. This system that Boss Tweed invented Let's call it Tweedism. <laughs> tweedism. So what Tweedism is, is any multiple system, any state, multiple stage system, where in the first stage, the Tweeds get to control the process that then creates the results that in the second stage, the rest of us get to vote among. And the consequence of Tweedism, right, obviously, is a system responsive to the Tweeds only. A system of inequality because of the power the Tweeds have in the system. Now, when you understand Tweedism, you begin to see it everywhere. Think about the extraordinary protests that broke out last summer in Hong Kong, right? Students and then their parents and then most of Hong Kong showed up to protest a law that China had proposed for selecting their chief executive. The law said the ultimate aim is the selection of a chief executive by universal suffrage upon nomination by a broadly representative nominating committee in accordance with democratic procedures. Nomination by nominating committee. 1,200 citizens would have the right to pick the candidates that about 7 million citizens would then get to vote among. So if you think 1,200 out of 7 million, that's about 0.02% of Hong Kong got to pick the candidates that Hong Kong got to vote among. Now, 0.02% is a really small number. Look how small that is right there. You can barely see it on the board, right? <laughs> If you tried to represent it, if this is all of Hong Kong, here's all 7 million people in Hong Kong, 0.02% is that. Tiny, tiny percentage. Who get to control the first stage, the nominating process, which then sets the candidates for the second stage, the citizens voting. And they feared, the protesters feared, that this filter would be biased because the 0.02% would be dominated by a pro-Beijing business and political elite. 99.98% excluded from this critical first step with the consequence, obviously, of producing a democracy responsive to China only, a system of inequality. Now, these cases are obvious, not just to you, but I think to every American. If you had any American look at this story, they would say, yeah, yeah, these are obvious cases of fundamental inequality. So why not this case, too? In America, we take it for granted that campaigns will be privately funded. But as you know, candidates, <laughs> funding is its own contest. Funding is its own primary 
or we should say funding is another primary. Right? You spend your time saying, vote for me to the voters, but before you get to say that, you've got to spend your time saying, give money to me to the funders. It's a primary. A primary takes time. Members of Congress and candidates for Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70% of their time dialing for dollars, calling people to raise the money they need to get to Congress or to get their party back into power. And that process has an effect. It develops in candidates a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what you do might affect your ability to raise money. Become, in the words of the X-Files, shapeshifters as you constantly adjust your views in light of what you know will help you to raise money. Leslie Byrne, Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she came to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. <laughs> then to clarify, she went on, you know, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> This process is a primary. It is the money primary. It's not the white primary. It's a green primary. And what it means is we need to think about who the funders in that green primary are. The funders. So in 2014, 5.4 million Americans gave even a dollar to any congressional campaign. That's about 1.7% of America. The biggest funders gave more than a dollar. The top 100 gave as much as the bottom 4.75 million combined. So this is not evenly distributed. But of course, we want to think about who the relevant funders are. We shouldn't think about just the billionaires giving millions. Let's think about the funders who give enough to matter to a candidate. The funders who give enough so that when a candidate's dialing for the dollars, the candidate's thinking, what does this person think about? So let's pick an arbitrary number. Let's say. $5,200, which in the last election cycle was the maximum amount you could give to any congressional candidate in the primary and in the general. Turns out in 2014, 57,874 Americans gave $5,200, which for those of you doing the numbers is 0.02% of America. 0.02% of America give even $5,200, which most candidates for Congress would tell you, you know, really isn't a lot of money, it's not the sort of money I'm worried about. $5,200 is the number of people who equate to the number of people who select the candidates in Hong Kong. This first stage, dominated by the tiny fraction of the 1%. We could say a Chinese fraction of the 1% dominate this first stage with the consequence, obviously, of producing a democracy responsive to the funders only. It's a Harvard professor. I'm not allowed to talk about Princeton studies, so I'll put that off the stage really quick. But there is a Princeton study, Martin Geilers and Ben Page, the largest empirical study of actual decisions by our government in the history of political science relating those decisions to the attitudes of the economic elites, organized interest groups, and the average voter. And what they found was for the economic elite, as the percentage of economic elites supporting a proposal goes up, the probability of that proposal actually being enacted goes up as well. That's intuitive, right? The more who support an idea, the more likely it is it will be passed. Same thing for organized interest groups. As more groups support something, the higher the probability is that it will be passed. Here's the graph for the average voter. The average voter is a flat line. Okay, what that's telling you is, regardless of the percentage of average voters who care about something, it doesn't change the probability of it being enacted. It doesn't increase the probability if we go from zero to 100% of average voters. It has no connection to the probability of it being enacted, as they put it in English, when the preferences of the economic elites and the stands of organized interest groups are controlled for. The preferences of the average Americans appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact on public policy in a democracy. In a democracy. Right, this was to be the picture of our democracy. We're supposed to be steering the bus. Here we are, we the citizens, steering the bus. But here's the reality of our democracy. The steering wheel <laughs> has become removed from the bus. 
We don't steer the bus anymore, and the numbers show it. The numbers show it. This is the product of tweedism. It's the product of a fundamental inequality that we have allowed to evolve in our system. I'm not talking about wealth inequality, though, of course, tweedism amplifies wealth inequality. I'm not talking directly about race inequality, though of course race inequality ties to tweedism too. I'm not talking about sex inequality. I'm talking about citizen inequality. This is what tweedism is, an inequality of citizens in their influence over the political system. Okay, now it's not the only inequality that citizens face. It's the most clever, which is why it gets this clever title, tweedism, right? It's kind of hard to even notice it unless you do the numbers and begin to think about what the life of a candidate is, an experience many of you know intimately, but most Americans have no clue about, so it's clever. But it's not the most crude. The more crude form of this inequality is the plain old voter suppression that we see all across this country increasingly through voter ID laws or systems to make it very, very hard to vote in certain places just so happens to align with certain political attitudes and preferences, but this is a crude form of inequality practiced in our system. And there's a much more system, systemic kind of inequality in our system, not necessarily tied directly to wealth or directly to race or directly to um, economic aptitude. This is just the systemic inequality produced by systems like gerrymandering or one winner-take-all voting systems, right? In the United States Congress right now, 90 seats out of 435 are competitive. Wow. 90 seats. Which means for 345 districts in America, if you're in the minority, you don't matter. I'm not talking about racial minority. I'm saying if you're in the minority party, you don't matter to that congressman. Because that congressman or congresswoman realizes the only thing that matters is what my party thinks about, and I've just got to make sure that I don't get attacked from the far right or the far left, because that's the only thing that matters to me. So for every other citizen in that district, they think of their congressperson and think this person doesn't care about me because I have no influence over that congressperson's future. All these are aspects of the inequality that we have allowed to grow inside the system. And so when we say, what we're against, what we should say is we're against this inequality, but much more powerfully because it ties to a moral arc of the history of this nation. When we say what we are for, we should say we are for this equality, not yet achieved, this citizen equality that this citizen inequality is what produces what Elizabeth talks about when she talks about the rigged system. That is the cause of the rigged system. And citizen equality should be the fundamental fight we are stepping up to have. Right? We've got to stop being trapped by the tyranny of tiny minds who tells us the most we can get is dealing with student loan debts. That would be amazing, but that's the most. That's the most. Or these tiny little tweaks that maybe a president could get through the administration without Congress stopping. We've got to stop accepting this tiny way of thinking about what we can do and start talking about the fundamental change that would make democracy possible again. And citizen <laughs> equality is that. So I think we should start talking about the Citizen Equality Act that we need to pass. A statute, it would take just a statute. So here it is, the Citizen Equality Act has three parts. Number one, an equal freedom to vote. Taking all of the legislations being proposed right now to eliminate the suppression and voter ID laws to make it possible to guarantee people have equal freedom to vote, that should be the first section, the most important part to include as a lead because it's the one everybody gets and agrees with. And number two, equal representation. Fair vote and many organizations have been looking at the systemic way in which we block equality because of the way we allow representation to happen in America. And they have a whole series of proposals for making it possible for people to be represented equally again. We forget, for example, that the framers of our constitution had multi-member congressional districts. Mm -hmm. Multi-member districts. 
so that if you were in the minority in a district like that, you at least knew you had a shot at getting a representative who represented you. We've given up on that to create this system that the parties, both parties, can control much better, a system where we eliminate 345 seats and we focus our energy on the 90. So equal representation should be part two, and part three, citizen funding of elections. These three changes, <laughs> these three changes would be the most important statement for equality and the potential of democracy that we could have. And these three statements should be at the core of everything we do. Now, when we think about that progress, we should remember it's progress in the face of an extraordinary corruption that we have allowed to develop in our system. Now, when people talk about the framers of the Constitution, Many of us rightfully say, these guys who had slaves, these guys who despite there being people like Abigail Adams around still didn't give women equal status in their society, these guys you want to talk about? And for sure, our framers were oblivious to the importance of racial equality. They were oblivious to the idea of sex equality. They didn't even know what sexual orientation equality would have been, right? They were totally oblivious in all those ways. But they would look at us and they would be astonished by our own obliviousness because at the core of what they thought they were fighting for was citizen equality. When Madison described the Constitution that he had helped to draft, he said it would have a branch that would have the federal government which ought to be dependent on the people alone. And by the people, he explained in Federalist 57, he meant, quote, not the rich more than the poor. Not the rich more than the poor. What they were fighting was the democracy celebrated by the Donald. What they were fighting was aristocracy. What they thought they had achieved was a system that would guarantee that it wasn't money that determined whether you had equal status to be represented. They wanted a system that would include the widest array they could possibly have, and even their property limits only excluded about 7% and they thought they needed to exclude people who were dependent on others because otherwise rich people could buy them. They were committed to equality of citizens in the political process. That was their fight. And as much as we rightfully criticize them for their blindness, we should celebrate this one core ideal which we have lost. We have lost. This ideal of equality should be our fight, too. OK, when should it be our fight? You know, they say that Einstein had this wonderful quote, insanity means doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. It turns out Einstein didn't say that, which is really sad, because it would be the one genius thing Einstein said that I understand, <laughs> right? But OK. <laughs> Um, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. When I look at our political process, remember change you could believe in? When I look at our political process, remember believing in it before there was change? When I look at our political process, I begin to wonder, are we insane? Are we insane? Because when we know, as we know, the system is rigged, but we go on without fixing the rigged system, that betrays a certain kind of insanity. I mean, just imagine you were at Las Vegas, and you're there in front of a slot machine, and your friend is pulling the slot machine over and over and over again. And you go behind the slot machine, you see that the slot machine's been rigged. There's a little chip that's been inserted, guaranteeing your friend's going to lose every single time. You come around, you say, hey, look, the system's rigged. It's rigged. Look. And your friend says, yeah, that's terrible. 
a dollar in, pulls it down, pulls a dollar in, pull it down. But you say, wait, 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 what are you doing? And you say, yeah, the system's rigged, but I want to play, I want to play, I want to play, without even thinking, how am I going to stop to unrig this system? This is a certain kind of insanity. And the reality is, even in our own party, we see this too. Because every major candidate for the Democratic primary has acknowledged the problem I've talked about today. Every single one of them, though, practically puts it to one side. Just one issue on a list of 10 or 13 issues that we're going to talk about, as if without fixing the rigged system first, we could get climate change legislation or sane limits on guns, as if without changing the way campaigns are funded first, we could reform Wall Street or take on the insurance companies as if this corruption were just a detail, something to be solved, quote, in the long run, end quote, as if fixing democracy by achieving equality were something that could just wait. But it can't wait. It has waited too long. The core ideal of America, the ideal King spoke about, the dream of America, is that we are created equal, but Washington has remade our creator's work. Washington has made it so that we are not equal. This was to be the land of no second-class citizens, but from Ferguson to Philadelphia, America has become the land where it's business class that counts first, an ordinary citizen sent to the back of the plane. This reality must end now, in this election, in the first acts of the next president and the next Congress. This inequality must finally come to an end. We can solve no problem until we solve this. And none of the promises of these politicians, these glorious, amazing progressive ideals, none of them are even credible until we have a plan for solving this. We need a campaign that's more than just a partisan squabble. We need a referendum on this fundamental ideal, this ideal of equality so we can finally have a Congress that is free to lead. So when we talk about the Citizen Equality Act, we should be talking about the Citizen Equality Act of 2017. This should be our fight for this ideal to be the first thing the next president and the next Congress deals with so that we can finally get back to a place, a place where democracy is possible again. Because you know, you know in your heart of hearts, put the denial aside, you know nothing is possible until we achieve this equality. And you know we can't afford to wait. These campaigns speak as if we're electing Superman or Superwoman and as if they will come to Washington and wrestle the special interest to the ground. But we forget Washington is Krypton. Remember, Superman loses his power in Krypton. <laughs> Washington is Krypton. And when Washington meets the Superman, he loses the power. She loses the power. She hasn't the power to do all the things she's pos she said she must until we fix this problem first, because the system is rigged because a democracy with second-class citizens is always rigged because we need to fix that rigged system first and achieve, finally achieve a political system that respects our creator's intent, that we are all created equal and a democracy must respect us as equal. So what do we want? We want equality, citizen equality. And when do we want it? We want it now. Right, let's, this is the end of a talk, so let's do it as a chant, right? What do we want? We want equality. When do we want it? We want it now. What do we want? When do we want it? Now. Or at least by 2017. Thank you very much. <laughs>